All right, welcome back. This is Dear Baseball Gods, and I've got a great guest today. Ethan Gavon is coming on the show, and he is the founder of KeepPlayingBaseball.org, which is an amazing uh, baseball recruiting website. And it's really an in-depth resource, which is why I wanted to have him come on today and talk about recruiting. But let me go into his, uh, his background real quick. So Ethan played his college ball at Carleton College, which is up in Minnesota, and it's an incredible academic school. He was a two-way player playing infield and pitching. He was a uh, Rawlings Gold Glove Award winner for Division Three. And after college, he went over and played overseas in Belgium and Australia for a year. So he got a, a, a taste of uh, foreign professional baseball. After that, he came back, uh, was a coach at UC Berkeley, and then was a coach at Division One USC Upstate in South Carolina. So he's been around. He's done a bunch of recruiting, and he's got experience at all different levels in baseball, which is why I think he's got such a diverse outlook on the recruiting process. So he writes a ton. There's tons of great resources, again, on keepplayingbaseball.org, which is his website. He also has a podcast, so check that out. It's all about recruiting, and uh, so definitely worth a listen. That's one of the resources that I've used, and that's one of the ways I found him and wanted to invite him on the show. So without further ado, uh, here is Ethan Gavon. So, Ethan, how are you out there in California? Things are good, man. Got a little rain yesterday, much needed rain, but uh, life in California is definitely good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I appreciate uh, you coming on the show. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ethan is the, one of the founders of KeepPlayingBaseball.org, and I wanted to have him on here today because he does an awesome job, along with uh, all of your, your other staffers, uh, in putting out really great uh, recruiting information. And as I think every parent and athlete knows who's listening to this, the recruiting process can be very enigmatic, and there's tons of conflicting information out there, and uh, I think they've put a really great resource in place to help people wade through that. So tell me a little bit about your playing career first. Obviously, uh, you know, I, I gave uh, our listeners a little bit in your bio, but tell me about your path through baseball before we kind of get heavy into the recruiting side. Yeah, sure. Um, I've been a lot of different places. So I grew up in Davis, California, my whole life. Um, graduated from Davis High School in 2005 and uh went to Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. So I played there for uh, four years. And then when I graduated, I wasn't quite willing to give up playing. So um, also wasn't good enough to play at, you know, to get drafted or anything like that. So started exploring some opportunities. Obviously, uh, I went to some in independent ball tryouts, but um, you know, knowing what I know now, that was probably never going to happen as a a five nine right handed pitcher. Um, but at one of those tryouts, I saw a kid who I had played against in college, and he was heading out to Sweden the next week to to start playing abroad. And so I started looking into that and um, reaching out to some people out there and putting my kind of a baseball resume online. And so. Ended up playing a uh, season in Belgium. And then when I was over in Belgium, I met an Australian import, as they call him, from another team. And he said, hey, man, you should come over and play in Australia. And so I came back to the States for about a week and then flew out to Australia and uh, got rocked out there and saw the writing <laughs> on the wall um, and knew I wanted to stick with baseball. So I, I got into... Uh, coaching. Um, I got into grad school at UC Berkeley and uh, walked into the baseball office there and said, you know, I'll clean your toilets. I'll do whatever you want, but I want to be a college baseball coach. And so I spent two years at Berkeley um, under Coach Esker as the grad assistant. And then when I graduated, uh, me and my wife moved out to South Carolina, where um, I caught on at USC Upstate in Spartanburg, South Carolina. So that's kind of the the rundown of my baseball history. And then um, I got I stopped coaching college ball two years ago and started focusing on keep playing baseball full time. Awesome. So what did you study in college? And it says here that you played two way at Carleton. So obviously, like you went to tryouts and identified as a pitcher, but uh, was it tough playing two-way in college? And because uh, it says you played second base, and um, sounds like you did really, really well. 
Uh, tell me a little bit about the challenges of playing two way. Yeah, so I I played shortstop and pitched in high school, um, and I was recruited a little bit as both from different schools. You know, I thought I was going to end up going to a school like Cal Poly, or I had a recruited walk on opportunity at Santa Barbara, um, and those were mainly as an infielder actually. Um, but I got out to Carlton, and um, so I was the our what would equate to our Friday guy, but with the weather and weather in Minnesota, it's always crazy. And the schedule is a crap shoot. So I was basically our number one pitcher. And then when I wasn't pitching, I would play, I played everywhere on the infield, um, every position, including catcher at some point, um, but mainly second base and pitcher. So um, yeah, juggling that more, um, it was just about how my arm felt, you know? So we would do some, creative stuff with our pitching staff. And so I would actually start two games a week and wouldn't really throw a bullpen. Yeah. Um, and so it was really just monitor, monitoring the way my body felt. But um, obviously you have to, especially at the division three level where you don't have necessarily as much practice time and, and built in time, you just have to kind of take it upon yourself to uh, make sure you're good enough to do both, you know, to put in the work. So um you know, in terms of it's something that I've been doing my whole life, so it wasn't really anything new. And at the time, I didn't really even think about it. Um, yeah. So I guess looking back, you know, it's just more about putting in the maintenance and making sure I was strong enough and healthy enough to, to handle both. Well, I know most guys, you know, they struggle to do well at one. I mean, a lot of guys that succeed in high school going to play college ball and then, you know, they it, it's a big level up no matter what level you play out in college. And uh, for you to, you know, you're a Division Three Gold Glove Award winner, which is amazing. And then you hit 363, uh, looks like one of your best years. So, um, but, you know, people forget when they look at, I think, uh, people like, oh, I'm drawing the, of course I draw a blank right now on the most recent <laughs> uh, Major League star uh, coming from overseas uh, to play two-way. Um, uh, Shohei Otani. Otani, yeah, yeah. You know, like, it's not just the fact that, you know, he's super coordinated and an amazing athlete, but the amount of time you have to put in just to be a okay pitcher is really vast. And then the amount of time you have to put in just to be a hit above 250 is really vast. And then to do both of those things and succeed at them, I don't think most people realize how much work that is where they think, Oh yeah, just let him hit. Well, there's a lot that goes into being good at both of them. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's not just a, a time balancing act but just like you said how your body feels and i just don't think people have quite a, a level of appreciation for you know what you did and what other two-way players you know have to go through um, yeah well it's also you know it's it depends on the situation right so for me it was very clear that my number one priority needed to be pitching because we didn't have as much depth on our on our roster on the mound and so that was definitely my focus and knowing that probably helped a little bit and um I would describe myself as a mediocre bat at best for most of college. And then things clicked a little bit uh, senior year and I put it, to, put it back together. But um, yeah, it's, it's a lot, but having, having that understanding of how you fit into the bigger puzzle is, uh, was definitely helpful for me. Yeah. And I think your school Carlton college uh, is an interesting um, kind of point to get rolling a little bit on the, the recruiting side, because uh, here at, at my academy, we have a player who is currently at Carleton. He's entering his second year. He had a very successful freshman campaign. Uh, and he's a unique recruiting um, story in general because he wasn't like a, a dominant high school player. He's an outstanding student, an extremely bright young man. Uh, but he was pretty relentless in, in saying like he, he was going to play college baseball. And uh, he pretty much made that happen through sure, uh, sheer force of will. Um, and I, and from what I've heard, like Carlton is just unique because it's such an amazing academic school. So tell me a little bit about that, like how you made all those pieces fit, like why perhaps Carlton is going to recruit maybe a different kid like Matt and like yourself than, than some other schools. Yeah. So I think Carlton kind of self-selects, right? Because it's very academic. Um, if you don't have certain marks, you know, you just, you're not going to be in that that pool of applicants that they're considering and 
from what I understand, they don't really budge with, uh, with athletes much. So, um, you kind of, you don't really get that benefit of the doubt. And so, um, it also draws a bunch of unique kids. And I, th I think so, you know, the kid that you're talking about, I'm sure he had really good grades and that, you know, that provides him with that opportunity. And so, you know, just speaking from the, the recruiting side, what I'm doing right now, you know, it always helps to have good grades, good test scores and be, uh, you know, a well-rounded individual off the field. So, um, I think Carlton really provides a lot of opportunities. So, you know, for me, one of the frustrating things was coming from California where it was super baseball focused and, you know, I had professional aspirations and um, always thought of myself as someone that would end up at a, a division one school. Um, so some of the frustration that I had was on the baseball side, not being as intense as I would have liked it to be, or not having the support from, uh, a financial standpoint as I would have liked to have, but at the same time, that also provided a lot of opportunity for other things. So I had a radio show. Um, I got to study abroad for a semester, which, you know, are things that are pretty unheard of at most programs, but I was able to do that because Carleton is a school that really values, you know, well-rounded students and providing a, a lot of different experiences. So, um, the other part of that is, is just the workload academically. So, you know, your class sizes are on average 15 kids. So, you know, you're not really going to be able to sit in the back of the class and not do your work. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're talking a couple hours of reading and homework each night. And if you don't do that, you're going to get exposed. So, um, you're juggling, juggling a lot of different things, but I think that actually helps you because you just have to stay on top of your stuff. So, you know, you know, I have to lay my schedule out in advance. If I want to be successful at baseball, I'm going to have to fit time into an already busy schedule with academics. And so um, I think, you know, it just speaks to the different opportunities that are out there for guys. So if you really want to play college baseball, um, but you also have other things that are priorities, you know, there's a school for you. So the biggest thing, you know, for me was just, hey, I'm going to have a chance to play play college baseball. And when you have that opportunity, anything's possible, right? Mm -hmm. And so for another kid, um, it might be, hey, I want to be a doctor, but I also really love playing baseball. So a school like Carleton has a good track record of, of providing for med students is a, is a good spot. So yes, juggling a lot, but... Um, also providing some unique opportunities that a lot of other uh, college baseball players don't get. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, it, it sounds really, it like almost cuts into you, I think, when people are like, look, almost no one goes pro, like you're not going to go pro. So like no one wants to hear that as an athlete, right? Like you want to have your dreams right. and you want to think there's still a window open. And I think baseball is unique. One of my, my previous guests uh, last week, was talking about that he said you know like baseball is unique you can go to any school almost and just keep developing and you never know like guys who are undrafted at a high school become first round picks out of college like that's not that doesn't happen in any other sport right and guys who are just completely under the radar go to juco they de they they get way bigger right they hit their growth spurt they just hit their stride they go to d3 they get still get drafted so there's always an opportunity with baseball that i think is unique compared to other sports which is cool but you're right. You do have to plan for other stuff. And it's not I, – I, I go back and forth on it personally because, you know, when I was in college, I didn't care about my academics at all. I still got good grades. Like, I went to class. I got a 3.3-ish when I graduated. Like, I was a good student. Like, my coaches had no issue with me. Um, but I, like, wasn't passionate about what I studied. Uh, like, the only thing that I really wanted out of my life was, was baseball. Um, but I still like uphold, I upheld the other side of the bargain, right? I wasn't going to be destitute. I wasn't going to be living in a dumpster if I didn't get drafted yeah. or whatever. Um, so there's that, but you know, it, it's, it's hard to find, I think mentally where people understand the balance where it's like, look, find a place that fits you academically and maybe where you want to live as well. Like where you're going to build a lot of connections 
and is going to be good for you as a baseball player because you never know. Like, give it a shot. Like, study to be a doctor, but give it a shot. And if you get a chance to go play, go play. So when right. would you say that the uh, – because I know there's – today we're going to cover a bunch of different kind of recruiting myths, and Ethan's going to going to help us dispel, since he's really a, a recruiting expert, um, you know, some of these myths. But I think it's a common misconception that the recruiting process needs to start really early – and that, uh, you know, these showcase companies and sometimes recruiting companies that will talk to you, they'll be like, hey, sign up for this package. Earlier is better. Um, but I don't know. Like, is earlier better? And, like, when would you recommend, because we have a lot of parents and coaches and kids that listen to this podcast, when would you say the recruiting process uh, should start? Yeah, so I, I think a lot of that stems from a common misconception. Like, there's this uh... – <laughs> there's this sexy image of the recruiting process, right? Where it's like, Hey, I'm talking to all these coaches. I'm going on all these visits. Um, it's kind of glamorized. Right. And social media helps with that, where people are tweeting about, you know, blessed to attend so and so and so. And, um, and so it really puts a lot of pressure on kids. So I actually think the bulk of the recruiting process is more about just doing your research and understanding the way the process works. And so I think people have the misconception that the recruiting process is, you know, seeking exposure and uh, putting yourself out there and talking to college coaches. So I actually do think the recruiting process is best started very early. But by starting the process, what I'm talking about is just starting to develop an understanding of things like eligibility and how your course schedule is going to impact where you can play college baseball and, you know, understanding about all the baseball opportunities that are out there for college baseball. Right. So, you know, for me, just to, to go back to my story, I got really lucky with Carlton. I ended up at a great fit, but it wasn't because I knew that's what I wanted. I just, yeah, it was dumb luck. Right. So, you know, starting to, develop priorities like we were just talking about so what's important to you do you want to do you want to stay close to home do you want to play right away do you want to play at the highest level possible even if that comes at the expense of riding the pine um and so i think these are all really important concepts for kids and parents to start considering early on um and the more you you know knowledge is power right and so if you've never been through the recruiting process or you, um, you've you never seen it close up, I mean, there's really no reason for you to understand all the hoops that you're going to have to jump through unless you start this process early. And so um, we actually advise that parents and kids start to think about this, you know, as early as the summer before ninth grade, because your grades in ninth grade count just as much as your grades as a senior. And then also the classes that you take. So making sure that you're straight with your NCA requirements. Um, you know, the last thing you want to do as a recruit or a parent is close doors that you don't even know you want to explore down the line, if that makes sense. So, um, so yeah, the misunderstanding is that the recruiting process is seeking exposure, but um, we do believe you should start early but that's more about exploring what's out there and building kind of that base knowledge that's really going to pay off down the line. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think, uh, like you said, and I was actually helping, a so th there's like a baseball sort of Facebook group for elite baseball performance.com, which is another good resource just for baseball training information in general. Um, I, I edit articles for the, uh, like the coaching side of that website. And in this, mm -hmm. this big group, uh, this big group chat on this Facebook uh, group, there was a question the other day where a guy said, hey, like I'm looking for information on college pitching velocities for a, like a research thing he's doing. And I said, well, uh, that might be really tough because in college baseball, like the continuum of pitching velocity varies really. It's from like 80 to 98 miles per hour. Like it's a huge variation. And he's like, oh, I'm like, I, I think for your project, you're probably better off looking at pro velocities, which are a lot more stable. Like they're going to be 90 right. to, ni to 98. Uh, but that was just like it, it was like a microcosm of the fact that like playing, quote unquote, college baseball 
can mean just like vastly different things and your experience can be vastly different and it's not just like i want to get drafted i don't care which team picks me there's a lot of care that has to be taken because there's 300 plus division one schools and then there's what probably equally that many for division two and division three and uh, junior yeah. college nai i mean there's like 1500 schools you could pick from so you have to yeah, have a good 16. idea of like how to how to narrow that field down right yeah and i think you know we i gave a talk recently and it's about you know number one knowing what you want right so knowledge of self goes a long way so at while your priorities might change from your freshman year in high school to your senior year and they they definitely should change as you kind of barrel closer to picking a school um you know any one one point in time you should have a pretty good idea of what that fit looks like because if you don't know what you're looking for it becomes a lot harder to find it so that knowledge of self is super important um, number two just understanding the opportunities that are out there you know, like you said there's there's over 1600 college baseball programs out there so you know the, the schools that you see on TV during the College World Series, and that's a, a tiny, tiny sliver, right? So um, we kind of build up this this idea in our head that we have to go to one of these schools that are more well-known, but at the same time, there's a really good chance that the perfect fit for you or you know, 10, 15, 20 schools that are a perfect fit for you, you've never heard of or considered. So understanding what's out there and then understanding kind of the steps that you're going to have to take in order to to find that school and then that kind of builds up the base of your you know your personal plan and then comes down to just executing that plan but um, i think you hit the nail on the head when you say you know there's tons of different opportunities out there yeah so let's talk about actually getting exposure then so you know if you think the the process starts early by doing your research and having an idea of what you're looking for when then does a player need to start getting in front of coaches and getting exposure yeah so i think the hard part about exposure is it's really different for for everyone right so you can't really say like hey your junior year you need to start seeking exposure because you know juniors are in vastly different places so i think the biggest criteria is when you have the skills that are being recruited you know so if i want to play at the division one level um and i do my research and i you know let's say i want to go to big time university right so i jump online and i look at the roster and i want to pitch i see that they don't have any pitchers who are under six feet tall right um and then i do more research and i find out that hey you know none of the right handers throw uh softer than 88 with their fastball from videos that I've seen. So now I've started to kind of dial it in. And so as soon as I start hitting some of those things that they are looking for, um, that's when I should start kind of seeking exposure. So, you know, it's different for each kid. It might be, you know, some obviously get it when they're freshmen in high school, um, but others might have to wait until even their senior year to really put themselves out there. So um, I think it depends. I think there's certain ways that you can tell that you're ready to start seeking it. Um, and all of those are kind of grounded in having this objective and realistic view of your abilities. And so, um, you know, one would be if you know someone, a scout, a coach who's well-versed in college baseball and can say, hey, I think you're you know, I think you would fit well at this level or with this type of program, you know, you should start reaching out. Um, I think just social media and the internet makes it really easy for you to kind of gauge where you're at. Um, and so a lot of times you might get interest from a program and that might tip you off. Hey, if this, if this mid-major D1 program is interested in me, there's probably a pretty good chance that other schools at a similar level or below will be interested in me so I can start to reach out. So um, we have a really good article on our website that kind of breaks this down in more detail. But I think the bottom line is you have to have those recruitable skills. Um, you know, you have to have the skill set that coaches are looking for because otherwise you, you know, exposure is a two way street. Um, 
So a lot of people look at it always as a positive, but you don't want to put yourself out there before you're ready and then get, you know, crossed off a coach's list or redlined. So can you, uh, I think, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I think that's a really key point for people to understand that, you know, if, if you're out recruiting, cause you did a lot of recruiting for, uh, for, for upstate, uh, if you see a kid once and then they contact you again, in the future, are you going to, are you going to look at them again? Yeah. I mean, coaches are busy, you know, coaches are getting tons of interest. I remember, you know, the inbox would fill up brand new every day. You know, you start, you have 10, 15 new emails from kids that are interested. And so, um, the analogy I, I like to use for exposure is like, it's like going to the snow for a fun day, right? So if you are prepared for the snow, say you're going with your family for a snowboarding trip, you have the right clothing, you have the right gear, exposure is great, right? Exposure to the snow is great. But if you're driving over a mountain pass and you get caught in a blizzard unexpectedly, you know, without the right stuff, then that exposure to the snow really isn't that awesome anymore. So, um, yeah, as a coach, if I see a player one, two times and they're not cutting it, I'm not going to waste time recruiting them. Um, I probably won't respond to their email if they email me. So, yeah, to your point, I think um, being exposed in a negative way hurts recruiting, um, hurts your chances getting recruited, but also you just end up spending a ton of money that's unnecessary. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have, and that's, that's one of the tricky things about, you know, a for-profit recruiting company, right? Is like, they depend on your money to exist. And so they give you an evaluation, but they're not going to tell you that you're terrible because they, they depend on you to come back to their showcase the next time. So they're probably going to give you some ideas of what you need to work on tell you you're good enough so that you'll come back the next year hoping that you've made those improvements um, but not give you the honest and objective feedback that you need to to really put together a solid development plan um, so i got off on a little tangent there but i think the bottom line is if you if you seek exposure at the right time um, you're really gonna you know you want to strike when the iron's hot and so you're going to put your best foot forward and for some, it might not be good enough, but um, for other schools, you know, at least you're you're putting yourself out there when you're at your best. Whereas it would it would be a shame to get written off before you've even made some of those gains that you can make throughout high school. Yeah. So to summarize uh, some of your points, kids should pretty much wait till they're ready. Where if they feel like they have one impression to make, it could, they have a good chance of making a good impression. Um, and that you know if they don't choose the right time they might cross themselves off a list where you know they might otherwise maybe have a chance in the future or uh you know maybe they just kind of blow on their budget so yeah I, yeah I, I think to summarize and i know i kind of jump all over the place um because i just have so many things going through my head about these topics but i i think to summarize it's yeah you, you need to wait and you need to be patient so you need to develop recruitable skills and have a way of understanding that you know this is what college coaches are looking for and i can i can show that to them now and so i think that's how you know the best time and anything before that is either going to hurt your recruiting or, or waste your money yeah and i remember we went through that i mean I, I have a personal story with that when i was uh after i graduated from college i was coming back from tommy john surgery and i desperately wanted to get my shot in pro ball and so there were, you know, right before the draft, uh, was it when I was about at uh, like 10, 11 months, and I, I wanted to go to some of these open scouting combines, you know, like the Royals were holding one, uh, Major League Baseball Scouting Bureau was holding one, like they're everywhere because they just want to make sure they've like done their due diligence and seen everyone who wants to, you know, get in front of them. And my coach right. was like, hey, I don't think you should do this. And I'm like, but I like touched 90. I'm like, I, I you know, I can do it. They're like but you're going to go throw 86 to 88 and they're not going to sign you. And then when you are 88 to 92 in three months, they're not going to look at you a second time. They're just going to say, right. no, we've already seen Dan. We don't need to see Dan again. And, yep. uh, and they were right. I went to the tryout anyway, cause it was just uh, a Royals one. And I just wanted to like, see what I could do. 
Uh, and so there was like a, maybe some merit there, but they were right. They were hundred percent right that I was, I wrote myself off that day and it didn't matter. It was just one team. Like it was just part of my process, but they were hundred percent right. And it was sound advice that I definitely wrote myself off that day. And, uh, who I was at that point in time got written in a little scouting report and that was what was locked in. That was who I was, even though three months later I was a different guy who might've been valuable, you know, to a team like that. So I can definitely, yeah. uh, I definitely relate to, to jump in the gun. So when people email you and they have interest in, in your school, um, I'm sure you see, you've seen myriad emails of good and, and, and bad quality. So give me some, some email communication do's and don'ts like what should kids and parents be doing and what should they not be doing for sure so we've done a lot of research on this in the last couple years you know just getting feedback from college coaches um and then also you know my personal experience number one the email it needs to come from the player um so whether the parent is helping on the back end uh, to edit and do those kinds of things uh, which i think they should be and is helpful um the player needs to be the one who's doing the communicating. So when we've pulled college coaches over the last couple of years, I think every single college coach except for one has said that they want the player to be the main source of communication throughout the recruiting process. Um, so that's number one. Players just develop a, an email address that you're going to use for your recruiting stuff. Um, you know, nothing with a crazy name, just, hey, John Smith, a 2019 grad right at mm -hmm. gmail.com or whatever so create your own account um number two personalize it so the quickest way to a, a college coach's uh, trash bin for an email is dear coach form email that's sent to um you know a bunch of different coaches um so it has to be personalized Take the time to look up and spell the college coach's name correctly. Uh, send it to their head coach, CC their recruiting coordinator, and their second assistant. Um, you have to show that you've taken the time to be to be serious with these coaches, or else they won't be serious with you. So, you know, my personal favorite was you'd get a, a an email from a kid, dear coach, with no personalization. Um, really interested in your school, blah, 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 blah. And then you would look and they, they had sent it to like 80 different college coaches. Yeah, they cc um, you. Yeah, they could, you could see all the emails. And so am I going to spend any time looking up that kid? Definitely not. Because one, they didn't attend to the details. So they, they didn't even take the time to make it look like they were <laughs> serious about the school. And two, it's, you know, coaches want to be recruited just as much as players do. So show you've done your research would be number three. And, you know, take the time to just in one one sentence, hey, um, you know, one or two sentences, this is why I think your school is a good fit. You have the, the kinesiology major that I'm looking for. It's a mid-sized school and it's 30 minutes from my home. And, you know, just in that one sentence, um, you've told the coach a lot about you as a person. Um, and so those are three kind of main ideas, but then also the, the information that you pro provide is obviously incredibly important. Um, video is a, is basically a must now. So, you know, you don't have to get a video professionally made, but college coaches, if they can kind of evaluate you and see if you pass the eyeball test um, just through your email, you know, 20 30 seconds of video uh, that's going to go a really long ways and so um, again on our website we we cover this at length but uh, you want to include your grad year you want to include where you play you want to include uh, contact information for your coaches um, you want to take the time to fill out the questionnaire ahead of time and let them know and that way you can provide all the information they need but you want the email to be short and concise and have, you know, just the essentials because no college coach has the time to read a couple paragraphs. So um, very pointed email, personalized, and that's kind of the, 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 the gist of it. How, uh, how important are including stats? 
So our research has been a little bit mixed, um, but the vast majority of college coaches don't really care for, for your stats um, because your stats don't tell them who they've played, who you've played against, the quality of the competition. Um, it, it doesn't tell them, you know, you could hit 300 in high school, but you know, all your hits come against the pitcher who throws 70 and anytime someone throws 78 or higher, you know, you make an out. So um, stats are, are a poor way to compare yourself to your peers. They're a poor uh, sales pitch to college coaches because they, they just really don't hold that much value. Now, some guys like to see that, hey, this guy's hitting at least 300 in high school, right? But what college coaches really want to evaluate is your skill set because they're trying to project to see whether they think your skills will play at their level. So um, stats basically just take up space and time and don't really provide that much value to college coaches. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, I've kind of relayed a similar thought. And I know that, you know, there's the sentiment that if you can't dominate in high school, how are you going to dominate in in college, right? How are you even going to play? Because obviously it's going to get harder as you get to the next level. And so on that note, like, yeah, stats are somewhat relevant. But like you said, there's so much to the eye test and being aware, even in like pro ball, like, you know, where, yeah, this guy will beat up the number five starter, get his hits against the number four starter. And then when he faces the number one and two guys, he's 0 for four both days with, you know, six strikeouts. So it's really right. tough to, for you know, for any parents who are listening, it's it's just really hard to be objective with with uh, with with stats, like you said. It's just it, it just like almost mirrors the levels of college baseball. Like that's why most of the highest draft picks come out of the highest Division One conferences. You know, like the SEC, the ACC, you know, the Pac-12. Uh, you know, conferences like that. The players are so good, top to bottom. Where if you dominate the SEC. Like they have a very good idea that you're going to be a, a, a good safe pick to at least right. be a decent pro player, right? Uh, but in high school ball, it's just it's so hard to know. I mean, you could play in, um, yeah, you played uh, high school baseball in California. So comparing <laughs> California baseball to you know to small town Missouri baseball or small town Illinois baseball or wherever, it's almost going to be no comparison. So I think right. Uh, you're right. So what are other objective ways that they can? they can help. I mean, is exit velocity, is that stuff important or like video obviously is probably the number one thing, but um, is there anything else tangible that they can give? Yeah, I think video is obviously huge, but um, to take that a step further, the more measurables you can show them on video, you know, like, Hey, I'm throwing a bullpen and have a radar gun in the screen because that's verifiable information. And so you basically want to give, college coaches a taste of what you can do and you're trying to get them to pursue you right you're trying to get them to do more research and so if i can show that i throw 90 then that's really gonna help right Uh, regardless of what level regardless of whether i can throw strikes that measurable resonates for college coaches you know if i can show that i can that i have an exit velocity of 100 then I, that tells college coaches something. Um, so I think the more measurables you can include a you know, 60 time or times to first base, um, pop times or the throws in frame uh, and live speed so that a coach sitting at his desk can just pull out his stopwatch and say, yep, that kid just popped a one nine or, uh, you know, so I think obviously the more data becomes intertwined with baseball, Um, the more important these measurable skills are going to be. So anything that shows that you can hit for power, um, you have arm strength, you have foot speed, uh, all that stuff really helps. And then I guess where my mind was going right now is, so if video is so important and YouTube is free, do we need all these profiles and recruiting services? What's Can you kind of go through like the – the pros and cons of hosting a recruiting video on a recruiting service versus just making it yourself. And and what is your sort of recommendation there as far as, you know, people on a budget or just general financial sense? Yeah. So I guess I probably should have started with just the background of 
what we do at Keep Playing Baseball because that will help with this perspective. But uh, we're a nonprofit, 501c3 nonprofit, and we're basically dedicated to providing the information and resources that high school players and their parents need to navigate the recruiting process successfully. Um, and our, our kind of main point for existing is that, you know, money shouldn't divide opportunity. So for us, our goal is to have a player who has zero dollars to spend on the recruiting process and they can end up on our website and have all the information and resources they need to make it happen. So it's not a, it's not a magic pill. Um, they're still going to have to put in the work and do this stuff. But our point is, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive to get recruited. And, um, you know, that's one of the myths that's kind of peddled around is like, hey, you have to go to this showcase or you have to have this account with this recruiting service. And um, to be quite honest, it's just not true. So uh, as the Internet has become a bigger deal and social media, it's become less relevant to go through some of these services um, and have to pay money because the, the easiest way to create exposure for yourself is to send a well-written email um, with a video that shows you have the, the necessary skills. Um, so using social media to your advantage, using free services like internet kind of make those profiles obsolete. Now, can you get recruited off of having a profile? Absolutely. So what we talk about is diversifying the ways that college coaches can find you. And so, you know, in our last college coaches poll, we asked about nine different ways that um, college coaches are finding the players that end up in their program, ranging from, you know, attending uh, camps or, or uh, showcases to sending an email to recommendations from trusted know coaches or scouts and the interesting thing was that every single answer got uh got the got the high scale marking so it happens very frequently except for the paid services or the recruiting services so um, i think the bottom line is college coaches any college coach worth their salt is going to be using a lot of different ways and methods to find players and the more players can, um, you know, spread their eggs out, so to speak, you know, if you can go to a camp or a showcase, that's going to be helpful. If you can play travel ball, that's going to be helpful. If you can play high school baseball, that's going to be helpful. If you can um, create a video that you can email out, that's going to be helpful. Um, if you can come up with a profile or a web page that has all your information on it, you know, that's also going to be helpful. So kind of trying to check all these boxes um, is helpful, but none of them are absolutely necessary. You know, if you have zero dollars to spend on the recruiting process, you can get recruited. Um, you just need the information to uh, to help you through that process. So, And that makes sense. So I, I, I sometimes laugh when I see these recruiting videos on YouTube where it's like, starts off as like dun, 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 you know it's like all the music <laughs> yep. and then it's just like this long ordeal and it's clearly it's it's clear the the parent and player put some effort and in, into editing and all that stuff but um i feel like that's probably not super helpful and relevant uh so use a coach like you said to the point give them like all the relevant for all the relevant information um but just keep it simple and short and factual so if they're putting together a video for YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how long should it be and, and what is what does it need and what does it don't or what does it not not need? Yeah. So for video um, and again, I know I keep saying this, but we have all these resources written out in detail. So if you need help creating a, a college baseball video or a skills video, um, we've taken information from our surveys of college coaches and kind of put together a blueprint for how to do it without spending money. So just iPhone and a teammate. Um, but uh, keep it two minutes or less. Um, put your best skills first. So you basically have, you know, 15 to 30 seconds to really capture the coach's attention. So you have to put your best foot forward first. So you wouldn't want to show fielding first if that's 
not your your strength because they're going to look disinterested and might turn it off before they get to your BP round where you're launching balls into the stratosphere. So um, best best forward, um, just take a couple clips. You know, if you're a hitter, a few clips from the side. If you can, a few from behind. Obviously, be safe when you're doing this. Um, fielding a couple ground balls. You want to show your actions. Um, you want to show your measurables as much as possible. If you're a pitcher, um, all your pitches from a side view so they can kind of get a mechanical breakdown. And then if you can from behind uh, either the mound so they can see arm action uh, is ideal with the pitch in frame so they can see movement. And if you have a radar gun, that's great. Um, but the, the main thing is make it short. Um, you don't need to waste time with background music, like you were saying. Yeah. Um, we know you have the eye of the, eye of the tiger. Like, we yeah. get it. We get it. <laughs> we don't need to see you doing uh, 50 pound dumbbell curls in your garage. Um, you know, you, you see some funny stuff in videos, but um, yeah, keep it, keep it basic. Show them your movement patterns. Uh, if you can, show them your measurables and just give them a, a chance to get a snapshot of you as a player. Okay. Um, yeah, and just so everyone who's listening knows, I'm going to put links to all the major uh, relevant web pages. Um, so Ethan and I will get together after this, after we're done uh, recording here. He's going to shoot me all the links of the most relevant articles from his website. So if you're following along, you say, yeah, that's awesome. I want to learn more about that. You can just click right there in YouTube in the description or in the show notes if you're listening on iTunes or any of the podcast uh, formats. So we'll make this real easy for you to to get what you need because like i said it, it you know his website is uh it's a non-profit um and even if it wasn't that's not really a concern of mine it's just really informative and there's just tons of good information uh where you can learn and and, and like you said navigate this process better um so let's jump back so you you mentioned earlier that email communications to start with the player uh and the parents should you know help because obviously you know i, I think we both know that uh sometimes uh young students aren't quite up the the grammatical mountain yet you know um so parents right. you can help proofread and just make sure uh they're including good information and not irrelevant and that their spelling and everything and organization is is sensible um but i know parents often get too involved and as a college coach a parent's opinion of their son is probably not super relevant so what are some other right. parent mistakes and uh, things that parents should probably just sit on the sidelines for or just avoid doing altogether? Yeah. Um, well, let me just start with an analogy before I dive into like do's and don'ts. Um, so uh, first, recognizing that parents have a really difficult kind of line to toe in the recruiting process is important because, um, you know, your, de your college decision is a lifetime decision, right? You know, this is going to impact your life in a number of different ways for as long as you live, good or bad. Um, and so, it, you know, to have a 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old make that decision on their own is also not something that you would necessarily want to do for most kids, right? Um, and so the analogy that we like to use is the parent's role in the recruiting process is like their role when their son gets his learner's permit. And so the only way that your son can learn how to drive is by actually sitting behind the wheel and doing it himself, right? But that also doesn't mean that you're going to flip over the keys and take a nap um, because at certain points in time, you might have to step in and say, hey, you know, back up off this, this truck. It's been swerving or uh, you're going to need to change lanes here, you know, whatever it might be. And sometimes you might have to have them pull over and um and drive the car yourself but you know you're driving the car as the player and and that's what college coaches want so from the outside of the car looking in the player is driving the car but behind the scenes it's a very different story where the parent is involved behind the scenes and they're kind of helping um, guide their son to, to stay between the lines so to speak and so um you know where parents often go wrong is, is, as you mentioned, if you ask any college coach, they're going to say, you know, parents are often too much, right? They're pushing their kid, they're 
uh, they're kind of hijacking the recruiting process. But on the same side, you know, the opposite side of the coin, uh, a parent who has um, has left everything up to their son is also asking for trouble. Um, but we see probably more often parents being over involved, over involved. So um, parents, number one, try and avoid becoming the center of attention. Right. So this is about your son um, and, and let him drive the process. Number two. Uh, it's, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, it's really hard for parents to be objective and realistic about their son's abilities. And so uh, that's a mistake parents make where they're not objective. They think their son's better than this player or belongs at this school. And that opinion just isn't really grounded or, or uh, backed up by facts. Um, number three, you know, they pay big money for every single exposure event and it kind of becomes the laughing stock of college baseball community, right? You, you show up, you're recruiting and you're kind of chasing some events schedules and the same kid keeps showing up at every single event and the same schools are present. Um, so that's, that's kind of a running joke among college coaches like, Oh, here's Johnny again, uh, showing us that his 60 time is subpar and, He's going to swing and miss at a one out of five pitches, you know. Um, another one is, hey, they um, they trust. A lot of people have their hand out, right? A lot of people have realized that this is a confusing process and they realize that they can make money off it. So a mistake that parents make is they put their blind trust in a service or a person or without doing their research uh, and they trust the guarantee, right? We guarantee or 99% of our players who sign up for our service end up at a college baseball program. And that's a mistake. The parents have to be involved in this process. Um, and then obviously if they're making decisions without consulting their son, uh, that's a problem. So these are kind of a handful of the issues that just generally speaking parents have. Um, I don't know if you want me to get into stuff that they're uh, more minor stuff that they're not even cognizant of that they're doing, you know, around the field and that type of stuff that can kind of scare coaches away and, and throw up a red flag. But those are kind of the, the main places where parents swing and miss, so to speak. Yeah. And I think I kind of know what you're alluding to because uh, for the parents that are listening, and this goes through every walk in, in life, whether, you know, if you're just a, you're in corporate America, you're a teacher, people don't want problems, right? They don't want to recruit a kid whose dad looks like a psycho or whose, whose mom is like constantly bringing him everything he might need through the dugout. And just like, you, right. you want to know that kids are going to be able to leave the nest and like legitimately leave the nest. And they're not going right. to be, you know, have these helicopter parents in their ear as a college coach because, you know, back when I was in college and I was 04 to 09, uh, my coach was, I think he said it to my parents or maybe he just said it in general, but he was like, your parents should never contact me. He was the, the nicest guy, but he was like, look, playing time and all this, like you're, you're a man now. I'll talk to you about playing time. You talk to us. We're a team. Your parents have no say and no business in your playing time and, and your direction and all this stuff. He was very clear about it. Which he has to be, because then you have parents calling, say, oh, he's better. Why isn't he playing shortstop? Why isn't he playing third base? Like, he should be starting. Like, And that is what's happening in youth baseball. It's happening in travel baseball. It's happening in high school baseball. Uh, and coaches leave the game because of it. And certainly coaches make mistakes based on how, you know, there there's definitely nepotism. There's politics. There's coaches that don't evaluate talent very well. Certainly that happens. However, most parents – that weren't players themselves don't have an accurate or objective view of, of where their kids really fit in in the world. And right. it can be really tough to sometimes let that go. And college coaches don't want to think, you know what, here's two players. They're both equally good. But this one, I just get the sense that I'm going to be hearing from their parents if he doesn't do well or he doesn't start. I'm just going to pass just to be safe. You know, I'm sure yeah. that happens, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, and you'll even hear a lot of coaches admit, like, they're recruiting the parents as much as they're recruiting the kids because, obviously, the parents have a huge role in, in 
turning that kid into who they're who they are and and the way that they're going to behave right and so when you see um when you see parents acting a certain way you know it's it's often a pretty good indicator that in under similar circumstances the kid might act the same way and so that's not really fair to the kid um but it's just it's the reality of the situation and so yeah par- parents are definitely being recruited too so when you and to be fair you know parents are in a really tough spot um where they're trying to navigate this important process and and their son really wants to play college baseball and they don't really know how it works and they just want to be helpful right but Mm -hmm. Um, that's why developing that kind of that background understanding of the way this process works is, is critical so that, you know, when like you're carrying your son's bag away from the field, college coaches are looking at that and cringing and being like, (laughs) not recruiting that kid or, you know, bringing a Gatorade to the dugout every two innings, college coaches thinking, you know, why couldn't that kid have planned ahead and and understood that, Hey, it's a hundred degrees out and, I'm going to need something to drink during the game and, and taking care of that themselves. So, um, yeah, I mean, parents are being recruited and, and that's why it's so important for them to understand their role in the process, which admittedly is, is difficult and it's hard to be objective. And, you know, that's why we have a a parent's resource page to try and give them a a realistic view of what their role needs to be. Yeah. Because, you know, and I, you could speak to this, you know, way more than I could, because I've never been a college coach or recruiter, but, you know, there's just a certain amount of contact time you'll get with a potential recruit to figure out who they are. You know, I I get calls from college coaches asking about our players, and uh, a lot of them dig very, very deep, asking a lot of questions, trying to figure out, and, uh, you know, who these kids are, and what their family's like, and are they, will they take responsibility for their actions, will they show up for class, will they... Um, how will they respond when they don't get the playing time that they're used to? Uh, there's just like so many different factors and they're just trying to figure out as best they can because they're going to have a limited lens with, through which to, to view any single kid that they're recruiting. So, you know, they're going to take all available information, good or bad, fair or unfair. Like you said, like, that's not fair if a kid is a really level headed kid, but his dad's not. And his dad's right. acting like a fool at the at the stadium or something. Like that's not fair to that kid, but it's all part of the whole package where you just have to like it's just like anything else, any other kind of relationship. It's just like dating. Everyone's looking for who is this person that I'm choosing to spend my life with, right? And yep. you just you just have to kind of consider it all and then over time you start to realize, okay, this kid's not like his dad or this kid is like his dad and his dad's an amazing person or his mom's an amazing person, right? They've raised him super well. Like there's all just so many factors. And, uh, so yeah, I think it's, it, it's good. F- I think the more repetition everyone gets with it, the better, because you see it even in, it's in any walk of life where people don't take responsibility for their actions and yep. you don't know where that exactly starts. It's not always a, a parent thing. It's just, but when you're on the baseball field with all the ups and downs and the slumps and being responsible for a really rigorous schedule, I mean, college baseball, 50 to 60 games plus your full course load. Like there's no excuses for you not to do all of it. Like you have to get it done and it's really, really hard. And, uh, yep. and your parents yeah. aren't there to help you through it. No, they're not. And if you don't get it done, you're not eligible. It's no one's fault, but your own. So it's, uh, they're looking for a lot, a lot of information to try to, make good decisions for their program and uh and so yeah i think you've you've done the right thing helping people through it because there is it's there's a lot of conflicting info and it can be just overwhelming to know to know where to start so as we get close to wrapping up what uh what are recommendations would you have for people um do you have any just like general things that you always like to pass along when you're in front of a new group um like you are today uh or speaking to someone or just uh trying to give a couple little analogies or stories or lessons? Yeah. I mean, there's just, when it comes to the recruiting process, there's just so much to choose from. Um, I, for me, it's about having a plan. Um, it's about trying to make informed decisions throughout the recruiting process. And the only way you can do that is, is just, Hey, spend 10 to 15 minutes a day learning about the recruiting process learning about college baseball, 
researching programs of interest or coaches of interest. Um, and so you're going to, it won't feel like you're making a lot of headway, but if you start this early on in high school, you know, 10, 15 minutes a day, 10, 15 minutes a day, you know, you're going to look back your junior year when the recruiting process is heating up and you're going to realize that you've built this, this mountain of knowledge that's really going to help you making decisions moving forward. And so, um, my biggest piece of advice would be get informed. Uh, you know, it might seem like a shameless plug, but literally we have endless reading. We have over 500 free articles on our website that cover everything from, you know, recruiting steps uh, to academic resources. Um, you know, I'm writing an article right now about uh, resources and how to go through the recruiting process if you have a learning disability or what the NCAA calls an education impacting disability. Um, so there's just, there's so many free resources out there, guys, whether it's us or someone else. I mean, you're providing outstanding content, free content for people as well. Um, you know, and a, and a glimpse into the lives of college coaches and other people involved with baseball. So, you know, it, there is no magic pill. You got to take this upon yourself to do the work. And if you kind of build up that base of knowledge, um, you know, you're going to find that it's incredibly helpful when you when you need it most. So have a plan and um, and the more personalized you can make that for what you're looking for and, and your realistic and objective view of yourself, um, you know, the better off you're going to be. So I don't know if that's a, a good piece of advice, but that is uh, that is something right there that they can do. Well, I think it's just like anything else where people want like a sometimes like just tell me what to do and it's like well with anything you know just like your baseball career or my baseball career or the start of your website the start of my website my business you have to have some sort of overall vision and you have to get started you have to have an idea what the stepping stones are in between it's not just like oh i'm just going to go to every showcase or i'm gonna just going to play ball until someone hopefully comes and sees me like that's not a good plan and i think people need to hear that uh, they need to take some time and be a little more diligent about, okay, who am I? What do I want to study? What do I want out of my baseball career? Where do I want to live? Like, what does life after baseball look like? All these different factors uh, and just start to slowly get a move on it. Because I, I think that is probably the biggest key that people could take away from, you know, this talk with you is that there isn't just like some magic quick formula, but there are definitely stepping stones and steps you can take and actionable things you can do to, you know, come out on the other side and feel like you have a good handle and good control over it. But, but yeah, yep. it's just like, everyone will tell you in the, in the bleachers, Oh, you've got to go to this showcase. Oh, you've got to do this service. Oh, I did this and it's been great. Oh, this person did this and it was terrible. It's just like any other gossip, you know, between parents in the bleachers like some of it's true some of it's great information some of it's not and some of it some of it just doesn't apply to you but it might apply to some other kid you know we've had some kids uh the recruiting process starts and it's crazy like we had one kid i was talking to louisville i was the go between but him between him and the louisville coach as he was just entering his freshman year like that's not yeah. normal but that was his the start of his recruiting process and then other kids it's making a blanket of junior colleges, sending out tons and tons of emails in February of the senior year. Like it just just depends and it's highly different. So I think, uh, like I said, I think I appreciate your website and what you guys have been doing. And uh, so if you are listening, this is not a bunch of, like you said, shameless plugs. There's just a lot of really good information. So keep playing baseball.org uh, is one of the places yeah. you can follow up with Ethan and his work. Um, can you give us other places people can follow up with you? And again, I'll put links to some relevant info uh, from his website and some other videos of mine on the, the show notes and the description here on YouTube. Um, but what are some yeah. other places people can follow up with you? Yeah, so we're, we're pretty easy to get a hold of. So we're on uh, most of the social media platforms, very active on Twitter. Our handle is at keep playing BB. Um, we're on Facebook, keep playing baseball and Instagram at keep playing baseball. Um, our website's definitely the main way to, to get in touch with us. Uh, you'll see contact information there. Um, we do a good job of getting back to answering questions. So, um, you know, my email address is just Ethan, E-T-H-A-N, 
at keepplayingbaseball.org. Um, so, you know, if you have questions about the website or recruiting questions, um, feel free to reach out. Um, and, and the biggest thing is, hey, guys, our, our resources are free. Um, all our information comes from current and former college coaches and players and parents of players. And uh, if there's no signups or fees or anything. So if you don't like it or you don't find it helpful, um, don't use it. But um, we're, we're having a lot of people who are using it and having success navigating this process. So uh, it doesn't have to cost any money. That's why we're here. It should uh, you, know, you, can, you can play college baseball even if you're on a shoestring budget. So... Yeah, and we've seen that a ton in our academy here. I mean, we've had kids of all ranges of abilities, and the thing that I think unites, especially the kids who just don't have as much natural talent, is they can find a place to play if they cast a big enough net and they're honest with themselves mm -hmm. and they find the right schools to fit. I mean, there really is 1,600 schools. I mean, there's somewhere to play if you really want to play badly enough. You know, it might not be your first choice of climate, of city, or whatever, but... Um, if you really want to play, there's a way to extend your career. So I think that's a, that's a great takeaway as well that hopefully gives everyone who's listening some, some optimism to just keep working and just keep, uh, you know, just like they say, trusting the process. Yep. Get, get yourself in the right process and, and trust it and measure it and make sure that you're improving. But, uh, you know, player development is the key to playing college baseball. You know, your skills – your skills, your your athletic skill set and your academic skill set are going to speak louder than anything. So if you focus on that, you're going to be in really good shape. All right. Well, that wraps it up for today. This is, I think, a great talk on recruiting. And like I said before, check out Ethan's podcast. Check out the website, keepplayingbaseball.org. And I'll put all the social media handles and links in the description and or show notes if you're listening in podcast land. So Thanks again for being here. I think uh, Ethan was a great guest. I think there's a ton of stuff you can learn from him and from others on the web. You know, But as far as a resource, his website is very complete, which, again, is one of the reasons I want to have him on because the recruiting process is just very difficult and sometimes conflicting to manage on the web. All right, so thanks again for being here for Dear Baseball Gods, and we'll catch you here next week.